Hello, everyone. Thank you for being here, first of all. And thank you to Kellogg Hubbard Library in Palmer City. This has been such an amazing event every year. This year is the first time we got our entire flow group together to read. We've always had someone missing, so this is kind of exciting to have all of us. Poetry, process, and perspective. We are all going to read or talk to you a little bit about an element of being in a group and then also read our poems one at a time. So for those who have never heard us before, flow stands for four left, one right, W-R-I-T-E. I have invited everyone together to form a poetry group and as we were doing our first exercise, I, I was finished first and I looked around and I was like, they're all left-handed. I'm right-handed, but they're all left-handed. And so I was like, oh my goodness, we have a name for our group. Four left, one right, and we just shortened it. Acronym, FLOW. So that's who we are. And we are gonna start with, um, whoops, sorry, Susie Atwood who is going to be reading. She lives in central Vermont. And she practices therapy, wilderness guiding, and writing poems about the convergence of human beings in the untamed world. She has a master's degree in education and counseling and is taught writing at the high school and college level and is also a very good friend. Susie? Thank you. Um, and thank you for coming to support um, Palm City, which is such a great uh, event every year, and to come and see us read, which feels special too. So, um, as Jesse said, we're all going to speak to some aspect of what it means to be in a group uh, together, and we've been together eight years. and. Um, there was nothing more gratifying than being asked to talk about inspiration. Um, it's just, I've been walking around with that for some weeks thinking, and I, I, I probably could have written a book by now, but now it's <laughs> like one minute. Um, and so inspiration at its root means to um, breathe into or put spirit into. and. Um, and in our group, uh, it is kind of the, the background or the breath of our work together as a group. Um, the poet uh, Bizwavu Szymorska, who won the um, Nobel Prize in Literature in 1996, uh, said that, um, described inspiration as, whatever it is, it is born from a continuous I don't know. And, um, which is such a beautiful uh, piece, and you know, it's that root of curiosity, I don't know. But um, I believe a poem is an answer to the question that follows, I don't know, what is this? You know, we encounter all kinds of um, facets of reality and our inner experience and it, and we you know if you have the writer's eye or the poet's you know um, eye you would just go well what is this and then you try to find the words so in our writing group um, what we do is witness each other on that journey of the what is this and I think that um, you know, it's a, it's a deeply personal question for each of us that we hold. And um, so often how we reflect on each other's writing is that we hold the thing that we're trying to express, each of us, as sacred. So that when we're, when we're um, uh, you know, critiquing a poem, you know, it, we're, we're very, very careful to work around clarifying the very sacred thing that each person is trying to um, develop. And um, so that is kind of, I think, 
the heart and soul of that inspiration. In addition, um, we, we extend appreciation and affection for each other. And, um, and so there's this uh, very lovely uh, container that we hold for each other that um, celebrates our sort of individual and unique curiosity about the world. And, um, and then collectively, we are able to, um, I don't know, show up for ourselves and each other uh, pretty much consistently doing the work. So that's, um, that's what I'm gonna say about inspiration. My guess is that if anybody else in our group spoke to inspiration, they would say something different and, and, and beautiful. So um, the first poem I'm going to read um, was a, a little over a year ago, I think when Ukraine war was just coming on the horizon. And it's called Spring. I can't quite name the moment when this season invited hesitation, fear even, of a world bereft of care, orbiting toward war. Yet like it or not, spring calls me to my yard, where rake in hand I see green shoots appear amid the snow melt, forcing up through frozen ground. A robin with its bright eye head cocked, descends to see if I have scratched up anything worth eating. Time marked now by budding, bird song, a nearly empty wood pile. At the hearth, a dying flame. Outside, an earthy breeze prevails. And the robin keeps singing, keeps singing. This next group of poems um, relates back to a place I lived not too long ago um, that was called Milk Moon Farm. And um, the title, this is short, this is a very short poem, the title of which is The Milk Moon is the May Moon. The Milk Moon is the May Moon the milk moon is the mammal moon, washing the green upwelling of seed, leaf and blade in pale shimmer, a long restful breath held overnight, seeding to sun, bud and petal, delighting the ruminant tongue, filling the silky udder, suckling the young. It's a little rhymy, but love words. Um, this next one is also about the same place. It's called Leaving. It is June. I'm waking early. Lilac wraps the porch in scent and purple. The rose throws pink along the wall. A finch has shifted to the vacant robin's nest and fawns step lightly through the grass below the barn. Leaving Milk Moon Farm, the green knoll of hayfields, trees and private spaces, ringed by hills, rising up to mountains, the long views gracing coop and pen, summoning bees to journey from the hive. I pack boxes, sweep, give away the books and tools this dream was made from, give away the hens. Now tracking something closer, deeper, and find. I've been created here, broken open by my labors, Milk Moon and I. I didn't move very far. <laughs> this next uh, poem was it's about freedom, reflecting on the freedom of humans and of animals. And I think I was thinking about detainees and incarceration and 
just kind of um, all came together. And this is called Barbed Wire. I left a dream behind, resettling just above the old milk house, south of the hay fields, in among a stand of pines bound together by barbed wire, no cows to keep in now. Three rusty, scarring strands embedded deep in bark, fur pinched here and there from astonished deer who leapt and in midair felt its spiteful sting. I pulled on leather gloves and spent an afternoon snipping it away, restoring a chore of undoing, as so many chores in fall become. The wires, metal thorns, cutting the brow of the living land. Sorrowful evidence of a need to detain, confine, some would argue necessary, yet those who leap would disagree. And um, my final poem, which somebody told me I read last year, but I had no evidence of that. <laughs> and um, and uh, it, it is actually the poem this year that sits on Main Street somewhere down the way here. And, um, and this poem I like because it's, uh, it's about our group, it's about our writing group. Um, and it's called Watermelon. I think of sweetness and the sharing of it on a humid morning in August, cricket call and crow song, sitting on a rain-soaked porch with women who know bitter and sweet, know how to tell it. Laugh, too, some of us who've nearly died. No guarantee that every day is sweet, but this morning we are tasting it. Thank you. Now I get to introduce our next writer, poet, uh, Mary Elder Jacobson, who uh, I believe lives in Callis. I have the, her short bio from the, <laughs> which is very out of date. Um, enjoys both the work and the play of writing. Her poems have appeared in print and online publications and elsewhere for, well, years. She lives in North Callis. And she is a very dedicated poet and is uh, increasingly getting published widely. So we're very happy to have you read. Thank you. Thank you, Susie. Um, thanks, everybody, for coming. Jessie started this group, and she just um, sort of always keeps us on our toes and raises the bar. So not only do we have to talk about an aspect of our practice where we have to read our poems and we have to introduce the next person. <laughs> All within a certain, you know, kind of thing. Um, so let's see, my first task is to talk about an element of our practice and I have been given critique. Um, and critique in our group, critique is different than criticism. I think Ruby knows that. Um, and it's really two-faceted. It has to do with giving feedback to someone and also receiving feedback. And how do you do that? You try to be fair. You try to do unto others. You try to you know, do the medical Hippocratic oath of first do no harm. Um, and let's see what else I wanted to say here. Yeah, it just involves whether you're giving or receiving, caring, honesty, being brave and forthcoming, and also being silent. Focusing on what works to guide the writer to her own determinations about revision, sometimes offering a solution and sometimes refraining. So that's critique for you. Um, I didn't know who would be here today, 
but I chose my first poem because I think there are things that we all have in common, and I know that many people in this room have them, um, which is if I asked you these questions, you would probably say yes, which is, have you felt loss in the past few years? Have you felt a loss of ritual in the past few years? Have you felt that you've been tossing in a storm? Have you lost a loved one? Um, I'll stop there. This poem, oh, have you reached a milestone age that maybe ends with a zero? <laughs> so I think everybody in this room probably could answer yes to some of those, if not all. This poem is called Animal Stories. And it was written for a friend who turned one of those big ages that ends with a zero, who experienced many of those things in the past year. Um, and like coming back to Poem City and being in the library, it was an occasion poem that was about a barn party. So you can imagine that you're in a barn um, when I read this. Animal Stories, Barn Party, Vermont. Well, friends, here we are again. How many heartbeats has it been since we were last shepherded in to the same shared space together? Once, some years back, one old friend was dumbstruck to see inside this barn a spread of fancy foods and guests in party dress, a crowd that couldn't begin to fill it up from the stalls below to the loft above. This farmer gasped and gawked and squawked, for God's sake, put some animals in this place. Well, friends, here we are again. We may not be a flock of sheep, herd of cattle, or litter of pigs, but haven't we all gladly sucked our mother's teats, laid down in grass, peed in moonlight, or eaten scraps. Maybe most stories of creatures not just surviving, but thriving, outlasting storms and floating forward into the future, owe a debt to Noah and his well-wrought boat and to his wife. Let's give her a line and even say her name, Nama. Isn't there more to every story? How this old barn is not a boat and we're not sailing over water, but aren't we, all of us, afloat? So how is it we stay buoyant? Let's flesh the story out. Besides the ark and Noah the carpenter, his helpmate and the messenger dove, let's not forget the animals themselves and the lessons of their living how they kept a lookout for one another, pulled out splinters with their teeth, licked each other's wounds, groomed the fur and preened the feathers of their fellow animal friends, then snuggled side by side for warmth through long stretches of chill and dark and damp, and even cracked some jokes to make each other laugh, and just kept on keeping on telling and retelling their own animal stories until the sun came out again. This poem is called En Plein Air, which many of you may know is just a French phrase for in open air, and it refers to painting outside or sketching outside. Um, and to jump off from the farmer, it begins with a plow. Maybe it's a John Deere, I don't know. Um, on plain air. The plow draws furrows in contour lines across the hillside from north to south as yellow ochre umber leaves fall from trees, curling downward like fine pencil shavings. 
and sun, lost in her own gradation studies, lays down her graphite marks by deft degrees, dark, then darker, darker still, until her long, thin shadows from ridge-line trees have sown the fields with cross-hatched strokes she smudged from west to east at end of day, highlighting her landscape in such enviable ways the artist can only dream of mimicking one day. And while we're on the topic of shadows in there, I'm going to read a poem called Shadows. Um, one thing that I sort of love to do myself, and if I'm ever, um, what I have taught or anything, it's, I find it a really good exercise to not write from the point of view of yourself, but to write from the point of view of someone or something else. So this poem is from the point of view of shadows. Shadows, without a peep, deep from the yawning barn's ink-black silhouette, we seep, unasleep. We spill in silence in puddles in every shape of dark. We curl up tight at your feet, then wake to pad about all day, proverbial cats Pacing the path, as mute as the marks beneath cats' practiced paws. Kind of fun to be reading these with this group because they all existed earlier, but now they're different. <laughs> <laughs> all right, this one I'm going to ask for a little audience participation. This poem is about bees. And it's also about being captivated. So I hope that you'll be captivated by the words. And then um, the poem ends with the words plum trees. So two beats, plum trees. And after I say plum trees, if you could just wait two beats, let the poem, plum trees. And then everybody, <laughs> So let me hear what you've got. <laughs> It's a peaceful summer day, and you're not frightened. It's not a swarm, it's just a little, little buzz. Okay. <laughs> Beekeeping. Once, we kept bees in hives, or they kept us. Kept us mesmerized, kept us drunk on dandelions, Dazed and dizzy by roadsides, kept us spellbound in fields, dusted in pollen, all abuzz. Kept us out in those downpours, in petals humming in orchards. Kept us fed on ambrosia, appetites aroused. The bees, the bees, left us amazed under plum trees. This one, I'm going to read this one for my friend, Allison. <laughs> I think she's the only person who's heard it before. <laughs> but she doesn't know the title, which we had a fun group talking about long titles once. And um, so I decided to give this poem a long title, and it's a sentence fragment as well. It's called Out in a Fall Field Overwhelmed with Sunshine End. Out in a fall field overwhelmed with sunshine and the wasp is immersed in the golden rod while I am enthralled by the gall. My last poem is a haiku and I realized I was looking back in time and it's the very first poem I ever submitted to Poem City, which was 
called Poetry Alive. Yes. And, and I'm not sure what year that was. I think it was 2000, I don't know. I'm not sure it was a long time ago. But it was really fun when um, I was very excited to submit something and then I ran into Rachel Seneschal and had been accepted and she said, oh, when I read that, I just knew. And then um, <laughs> it was really exciting because it was in the window of the knitting uh, store, which I forgot what it was called, but they did their whole window based. They got, they got inspired. Scotty Harrison's place. The knitting, yeah. what's it called? Studio. Studio? Knitting studio. Oh. So they did their whole window, which is like a highlight <laughs> of my life. <laughs> anyway, haiku. Bare knitting needles, bright new skein, stitching fresh green, leaf, node, leaf, Node leaf. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Mm -hmm. So I have the pleasure of introducing Andrea Gould, who's going to read next. I don't have her bio in front of me. Um, she and her writing are heartfelt. She writes from everything from a sense of humor to intrigue to grief. Her topics can go from blossoms to bovines to belly dancing to borscht. <laughs> her metaphors and her similes are often surprising. Her poems are unique. She is one of a kind. She's humble, receptive, giving, and curious. I could use a lot of literary terms to talk about her work, but what I love about her work is that it makes me go ooh and ah, and sometimes it leaves me speechless. Andrea Gold.
For me, writing poetry is a process of shining a light on something which results in making it sacred for me. Our poetry group has become a sacred and trusted community for me because we are attuned to one another, entering each other's inner worlds through our poems. In our process of critique, we offer affirmation and become intimate with each other's personal stories and poems. The poems become old friends. And so um, I'm going to read six poems that I've had in Poem City. I looked it up today. I guess Poem City first, the first year was 2009, I think, but maybe I'm wrong. Um, this is, I looked it up and it sounded like that was probably what it was. And I guess my first poem appeared in 2013 in Poem City. Um, after I decided to read this poem, I found out that today is, is actually a Jewish holiday called Yom HaShesh, is Holocaust Remembrance Day. And it happens that this poem is related to the Holocaust. And it's actually my closest friend growing up. It's about her mother, Bianca. And it's called Bianca's Soup. This is what remains, her recipe for Brahm Baraka. Woody Czech mushrooms foraged each May in the Bohemian forest. Marjoram, parsnips, carrots, half inch squares of celeriac. The pungent scent conjuring up the Jewish ball 1938 Prague, where Bianca met George. White peau de soie gloves to her elbows. Layered gown of organza and lace satin shoes. He filled her dance card with waltzes and tangos, securing her destiny, both of them forgetting the brown-shirted men marching in the plaza. And he did save her life. They were both in a concentration camp, and he was able to save her. So I grew up eating her food, which was unbelievable. And she, she became an editor of Gourmet Magazine, so she was an amazing cook. Um, second poem I'm going to read is from the 2018 Poem City, and it's for Sherry Olson, who I mentioned before. Um, 1944 to 2016, she died in 2016. She was a poet, a teacher, and a great gardener. Garden scissors stand in sustained arabesque, tiny dancer in my hand. Strong legs tapered to pointed toes while I snip chick bitty and donkey tail and fill glass jars with cuttings. Wispy stems dangle, lined up like budding ballerinas at the bar. Delicate rootlings become fleshy roots, intertwine, ask to be planted. Sherry, your succulents fill my sunroom while metaphors chasse across the page. <clears throat> this poem is from 2018 Poem City. I changed the title slightly. It's called Parkinson's Mime Class at the Senior Center, and it's dedicated to Rob Merman, who taught the class. 20 pairs of hands conjure creation, awakening the first rain. Small seeds and trees emerge, sway in the first breeze, the first breath, a succession of creatures slithering, shimmying, winged, and with the universe humming, the first beat of a human heart. We balance peacock feathers on noses, chins, extended fingers, make slow circles around ourselves, hold our breaths, defy gravity, then exhale as feathers cascade to earth like autumn leaves whose work for this year is done. This 
This poem was from 2022 Poem City. <coughs> Excuse me. It's called Pinus Strobus. And there's an epigram by Yoni Noguchi, which is, I hear you call pine tree. I knew she was ancient by her generous girth, creaking like an old house in the winter wind, thick bark and scales as dark as the eyes of the night creatures gathered near her at dusk, poised, waiting. Soaring above her neighbors, just below the hayfield, needles hanging in feathery fascicles, spruce limbs woven through her myriad of branches. She waits for the processional of 17 wild turkeys who crisscross the shadowy field and fly up to roost in her strong arms. Heads folded under wings, wings draped over branches, vigilant, teetering between response and repose. They find refuge high above the coyotes and foxes. This one was from 2019 Poem City. I changed the title slightly. It's Second Marriage for David, 1950 to 2012. You offered me sushi like an exotic bouquet taught me to sit Seiza style on a tatami mat and balance smooth black chopsticks between thumb and forefinger. You were cubes of rosy tuna dipped in shiru, mixed with green mustard. You were hot sake sipped from a small porcelain cup. You were jellied fish eggs, oranges marigolds, glistening like jewels, sweet, salty, slippery. You are a shoji screen, rice paper framed by a lattice of bamboo, hiding your interior spaces, mysterious as our brief marriage, until I read your obituary years later, survived by partner Brad. And the last one is the one that's in Poem City this year. The Tiny Burden of Her Death. And that title comes from a poem by A.D. Hope. I expect birds to rise in the air effortlessly, untethered by gravity or grief. Was it a miscalculation of velocity or a moment of distraction that caused a flurry of black feathers to tumble across the road, then scatter in the sultry air quiet as a prayer. And I'm going to and homesteader on unceded Abenaki land. Lisa emigrated to the States from Italy as a teen and is passionate about sovereignty, lineage, and indigenous ways of knowing. Her book of poems, I Won't Be Long Here, was released by Kelsey Books in 2021. For details, visit her website, <laughs> harmonizedliving.com. Okay. And hey, David, I wish I had to play with you. Did you know something? Oh, I do. It does have poems in it. It's called The Culinary Pharmacy, and it'll be out through Inner Traditions Press in December. And I will be reading from my book this evening, and if anybody wants a copy, you can get one at the back afterwards. Here it is. It's a picture I took of my home in the Dolomites in northern Italy. And um, 
such an honor to get to be here with you all and see all of your faces. It's amazing to think we've been writing as this group for eight years, and um, I wanted to speak a little bit about revision. And I love this topic because I never revised when I was writing poems. You know, in elementary school, middle school, high school, it was like the poem came out and it was you know, <laughs> pure gold, right? Um, and then I went to the Bennington Summer Program in 1994, which was and is a place where high school students can go to Bennington College and do work in the arts and all kinds of different arts. And I had an incredible poetry teacher there, and she really raked me over the coals around revision. And now I see revision for what it is, and that word comes from the Latin, right? Revisio, to see again. And I even think about this book of poems, which I wrote, you know, over the course of years and came out two years ago. And I would even revise the poems that are in print. And I think revision is truly a gift because it's a way to, to understand how we see the world as we are changed by the world through the passage of time, right? We're always sort of seeing ourselves again. And ultimately, I think poetry is revision because it is this opportunity to see the world again, see our experiences and what we notice again. And one of the huge gifts of our group is that through inspiration, through prompts that everybody brings, through the critique and conversation about the poems that we share, revision is happening. And often we will actually bring poems back to the group that have been revised and it's such a joy to see how we see ourselves in our poems again um, and how we're all part of the revision in this way and i actually wanted to start with a poem based on a prompt that Mary brought to us, an ABC Darian. So we were each given a portion of the alphabet, and our charge was to write a certain amount of lines. And you know, one line had to start with the letter F, the next line the letter G. And we all composed a poem together. And after all of the pieces were put together, we did each contribute to the revision. Um, and that being said, it was quite miraculous, really, to see just how it flowed and each one of our sections came together. So I'll read this, which is our collective group poem. A poem for all of us. Because grief upon grief returns praise in concentric circles, wrapping seasons spent diligently weaving words into metaphors that elevate our stories through the art of transformation, we form poems that transcend us, an offering, grateful for a day of sharing each month when we stopped to share words, honored by the presence of wisdom of each of you the intelligent dialogue that stimulates our minds, jewels formed from the craftsmanship of our seven-year practice together, kin at the table of poetry. Listening to the tremolo of loons, five daughters move together through the vividness of words, notice the shudder of scarlet leaves in autumnal descent, cracking open our hearts, allowing poetry to shape our stories. Quietly, at times, let's write and thoughtfully respond to the day's random prompt, suddenly suggested by an A to Z list of possibilities. Tomorrow, though, let's grow bold, revel in the world's utterly exquisite gifts, earth, water, sky, and sing. Sing loud. Viewpoint is everything. The seasons shift the weight of our words. Like a glade of birches, our xylem transports the food of our hearts, 
our yearnings for interconnection from our roots to our crowns. Poetry, the zenith of what makes us human, makes us friends. <laughs> <laughs> So the first two poems I wanted to read um, are actually from prompts that were brought, one by Mary, a uh, guzzle, which is an ancient Persian form of writing poetry um, that involves a theme and repetition. I think you'll pick up on it. Um, and the second one was brought by Andrea, and it is about all of us bringing a photograph. Bread guzzle. My father taught me that fenugreek, caraway, and fennel are the secrets to our rye bread. Hard enough to crack under a fist, we call it by its German name, Schutelbrot. Every fall, we stock Nanna's cellar with newspaper-wrapped stacks of this hardtack bread. After moving to the States, I spent a year researching the Roma who carried spices in their caravans for bread. They brought fenugreek, caraway, and fennel from North Asia. Wouldn't let those seeds drop until they reached a safe place to bake their moro. The Alps became this haven, and rye sourdough has been handed down ever since, bubbling into the staple with which we were bred. When I go home to Italy, grains are not the villains they have become for America's health-obsessed disdainers of bread. Instead, they are revered as keepers at the chapel door of seasons. There is strength to persevere if one at least has bread. Fenugreek cleanses the fluid body, caraway disinfects, and fennel helps digest what may be too dense about Lisa's pane. <laughs> Easter picture. On our way to church, mom in her coral jacket that I would inherit in high school holds our hands in front of Forsythia, first spring gold. My father, the photographer, calls for a smile, counts off, and Guido, proud in his navy suit, decides to grin through his freckles instead of making his usual fish face. I am the one who has something to say in my pink rim glasses and yellow dress with white lace. The snapshot captures me, arms flung skyward, head tilted back, leaving the others behind. And again, in the theme of revision, so many of these poems are ones that I've brought to this group. And it's really, um, in many ways, because of this group that my book exists in print. So revision and critique and togetherness are a gift. Um, these next two poems are sort of um, snapshots, um, character portrayals of different individuals. Um, so just let your imagination take you away. Chihuly over Venice. Loredana Balboni had heard the tromping of paint-splattered shoes across her balcony, even glimpsed the eye-patched man more than once, but never thought to mention him to her sister Letizia or suggest they invite him to sip prosecco from crystal flutes that, while dazzling under a glass chandelier at one of their seasonal feste, paled against the green grandeur of the glass this gapped tooth man blew, blew in his pilchuck work, workshop overlooking the quiet water of Puget Sound. So unlike the rising canals of Venice, it's a wonder he ever found his way to La Biennale or maybe she sent him away so she could marvel at the sculpture entirely alone, lie beneath it on her balcony by candlelight, wake up and take her gondola into the Canal Grande, point it to it with a grimace, pretending she had no idea how it had landed, suspended above her palazzo as though opera singers had wailed out each tail-tipped sphere during a midnight performance of La Caviata, Gran Teatro La Fenice voices rising from ashes as glass does, singing itself to life from a million grains of sand hiding inside each line that the sculpture breathed out of fire. Mm -hmm. Petrarca of Yogani, and Petrarca is a famous Italian poet, among other things, as you'll hear. 
As poet, he kept ten inkwells, roped to please persimmons so they might ripen before the bear of winter took them to her den. As priest, he gleaned pomegranates before Hades could count on too many gray months, hardened his sermons when fire would not warm the hearts of shivering villagers. As public official, he collected leather bag gita from farmers who herded goats and cows along the Apennine mountain spine. He would have preferred to trade cheese for their servitude, return to his home of river stone walls and wine bottle windows, light a taper and eat picorino with grapes and bread. I wanted to read this poem um, that is a great example of revision. Um, so this is a poem I wrote and this group actually suggested that mixing up the stanzas would give more of an element of understanding what my mom is all about. And my mom's lineage is one of mental differences and bipolar diagnosis, um, both my grandmother and my mom. And I, I took the group's advice because the poem as it reads now does give a little bit more of a picture of what it felt like to grow up with this person. Um, and so that revision was extremely helpful. Letter to my mom. My eyes welled when you wouldn't leave your bed for three days at a time with no explanation except a migraine. Your suffering bounced off the cold marble floors of our apartment. I wanted to avenge you, but there were too many culprits. Your father sitting on the porch with a shotgun when you missed curfew. Your mother running away with a car salesman to buy another pair of red pumps. Your church demanding a dollar every Sunday when your allowance was only 50 cents. After four miscarriages, you were born blue and silent until the nurse gave you oxygen behind privacy drapes at Kansas City Children's Hospital in 1941. Raising your babies in Italy kept you from getting burned until you had to return to Kansas walk over the coals of your memories, care for the failing parents who could not care for you. You don't believe you're crazy, but crazy has been rising slowly inside you since before you were born. A candle left to singe your mother's dining room curtains after all the voices in your head had stumbled to bed. You aren't able to dampen the flames that generations of women have fanned into a blaze I see behind those narrowing eyes. You rub throbbing temples and let the fire of your Welsh turned Midwest heritage burn you down. I am making a reduction of my life so I might understand yours. I'll read. I'll read one more short one um, about the Sabiona cloister, which is one of the cloisters we would drive past on our drive from the Adriatic Sea, where I mostly grew up, to the Dolomites, where most of my family lives. Sabiona Cloister. We leave Ferrara after dark, headed for our ancestral Dolomites, blind to changing landscape until the moon emerges and reveals that we traded the Po River Plains for steep peaks protected by holy ones. I roll down the window, hear cloister songs echo from a rocky fortress high above the autostrada, built with the same stone that harbors sisters praying. Everyone knows they devote their lives to spirit, yet no one is allowed inside to touch the secret, that which was never born but lives in the mountain, blessed by the bright moon and the moonless night. And I'd like to introduce Jesse Lavasco. Jesse is a poet, a visual artist, residing on unceded land of both Ashinabe in Michigan and Abenaki in Vermont. Her book Native was published in 2020. Copies available in the back. And she was a participating fellow of Nature Culture's Writing the Land Project, as well as a yearly contributor and facilitator for Poem City, and the organizer of us all. <laughs> Thank you, Jesse. What a group of poets to.
to work with, right? It's pretty amazing. These women are so committed. That word wasn't talked about, but I think it's really important to say how committed they are. Um, even you know, through Zoom, having Zoom as a tool, I get to be part of the groups even when I'm in Michigan and, and they're here, which is great. We haven't skipped a beat. It's been great. So my topic is the element of exploring the craft. So we could come to poetry group and just catch up and read our poems and do our critiques. But the best part of our coming together would be lost. Because monthly, we encourage each other to grow as poets, not to do the same old, same old. Each person is responsible for facilitating and bringing a new tool for us to use. So those things bring ways to change our thinking. We use forms and techniques that shift our minds. We take them out of, every person gets taken out of their comfort zones. Because we can get really comfortable writing in a certain way, with a certain rhythm. And we have all kinds of things that force us out of that. Everything from haiku to pantoum to villanelle, or using art to inspire an ekphrastic poem, or the lining up of letters in an acrostic poem. And Lisa mentioned a couple, too, that, that we used. But for eight years, I don't think we've repeated many. It's pretty amazing. And if you noticed, I don't know if, and maybe I should wait till I read to ask you this question, but. If you listen to each one of the poets, they all have their own voice. Even though we all work together, a lot of times artists in art groups will start painting similar, like their subject matter will become similar, and many poet groups start writing similarly. But I think because we have these tools and we're constantly refreshing our minds, that um, our poets have remained pretty unique and, and clear to their own style. So um, I guess I just want to say that exploring the craft really takes us out of, like if you, if you were a great cook and you just keep trying new recipes, you get to be even better because one informs the other. And that's kind of what happens with us. And we challenge ourselves by the experiences. And there's definitely a concentration and dedication to each one of these writers to develop their voice. So I would like to begin with my poems. I'm going to read the first one from Native, and it's a prose poem. It's called The First Immigrant. Never born. I dwell in foreign landscape. I'm going to start over. This was inspired by Clarissa Pincoli Estes, and she said this, this sentence, the soul is the first immigrant. And that is the catalyst of this poem. Never born, I dwell in foreign landscape. Flow with water, the color of blood. Sail shorelines of skin and bone, tread lightly on language of the ordinary, in complete harmony with fire and stars. When recognized, all life gestures through my fingers into fruition. I am a stranger in a lonely land, a small stone, a golden sun. Usually, it takes death to be noticed, the final fall, the last chance, the injury that changes all manner of things. How can I speak to you? I can't. I have no voice. You must look for me so that I can cross the border of mind into mythology perceived in the present. See me in another, the stallion, 
the bear, the ones who dance and sing, ones who orchestrate symphonies of astounding music, ones who walk the streets with grocery carts and sacks on their backs looking for homes. Hunger opens. How deeply do you want to discover anything other than your own reflection? Be curious. Have courage. You don't have to feed me. The gardens of the gods will be waiting. When the sky grows dark, the fires roar in the distance, the earth quakes or your life shapeshifts into something unrecognizable, you'll see me. I'm standing where I always am, amidst the rubble, upon a mountaintop, under an apple tree with you being. I've had the privilege of living with my mother as she grows old and loses her memory, and she's 90 now, and it's quite an event to kind of lose the mother you know and um, observe and, and witness what she sees and, and just be part of the conversation. This poem is called The Turtle Bird. A female pheasant appears one day in a place she was never seen before, her rotund body wobbling, scavenging for food in the courtyard gardens. Nibbling on fallen berries from an old tree, she scatters seeds found from the feeder next door. My elderly mother thinks it's a turtle until I assure her it has feathers. Yet I do not tell her she is wrong. The unraveling of the mind takes her to a different kind of seeing, and perhaps what she perceives is really there. The bird returns each day, like a peasant woman about her business, stops to see us through the glass. My mother is entertained, and I wonder if the bird is a spirit sent to notify us, not to fret, but to remain poised and trusting that all will be as it should and that even the pheasant has found pleasure in her new home. So this poem is a combination of acrostic, haiboon, and haiku. And it's kind of it's short, it's not long, but it, it is poetry is the title, and each letter for acrostic is P-O-E-T-R-Y. And then each one of the other poems will refer back to that. Poetry, penning words that express how I see the world. Opening to new perspectives. Evolving into creating an original voice. Trusting the process of dedicated writing. Reading a variety of authors to gain skill and inspiration. Yesterday's tragedies and stories crafted into poems. Each time I witness the news, violence in a vicinity far from home, Words become islands, small marks on paper in which to ponder my thoughts, capture them like fish in the sea, hold for observation. Words, a way to hold world complications in quiet, try to understand. So Lisa had mentioned that I was um, in the Nature Cultures Writing the Land Poets. Uh, I was assigned the Vermont Land Trust Trail on Sparrow Farm, between Sparrow Farm and North Branch Nature Center for one year to walk through and, and, and write poetry about. And then it got put into a Vermont, or a Land Trust book for many land trusts throughout the country, but Vermont Land Trust had three poets and I was one of them. 
And this is only one poem from that. It's called, What Steps to Take. My steps are not the bears, lumbering through forest ferns, pressing their weight, clawing bark, reaching berries. Nor are they thin prints of fox, arrow to the wind, swiftly scouting land for mice and moving food. I am not like wolf, masking my hunt around stands of trees and brush, waiting for prey. Who am I, daring to travel in this moss-covered land that my kind have separated from without asking questions? I know nothing. How do I walk so as not to disturb? Listen so that I do not disrupt. Sit quietly so that all creatures and plants around me are free to fly and run, sense that my presence is not a threat. That I will not squash partridge berry under my feet, take a birch to the ground, leave burning coals from a warning fire. And like any home that I enter, not dismantle the woodland altars that have spirited the caves and spaces with their grace. I'm going to read one more, and then we'll have time for questions, if you have any. Because I reside in two places, Montpelier, Vermont, and right near Detroit, um, Gross Point, Michigan, or St. Clair Shores in the, that area, um, I get to see a whole other part of, um, I know we have homeless people in, in everywhere. But this particular homeless woman really struck me. She had created a world under a bridge. The other side of the veil. On a highway overpass under a cement bridge, she made her home with comforters made of plastic bags. A shopping cart filled with old shoes, dirty socks, magazines, and empty water bottles. When she paced her ragged hair dreaded in her knee to her knees, like a mane intertwined with dust and debris. The roar of traffic was her symphony, echoing in sewer sludge. A guardian of her realm, she talks to the drivers going by or ignores them in mumbles, head toward the sky, to the spirits that provoke her. Does she see something that I cannot? Is she on the other side of the veil where voices live with stars? She could possess something ancient like a shaman in this corner of the street where she thrives in her story with nothing to eat. Thank you. And I must say, it's thrilling for us to be able to hear each other, because we are so hard at work when we get together every month. Um, it's, it's really great for us to hear each other as well. So as far as questions go, you can ask any of us. Um, I don't know if we should all just come up and be up here. Um, does anyone have any questions for anyone?
on plain air. The plow draws furrows in contour lines across the hillside from north to south as yellow ochre umber leaves fall from trees, curling downward like fine pencil shavings. And sun, lost in her own gradation studies, lays down her graphite marks by deft degrees, dark, then darker, darker still, until her long, thin shadows from ridge-lined trees have sown the fields with cross-hatched strokes she smudged from west to east at end of day, highlighting her landscape in such enviable ways the artist can only dream of mimicking one day. tell you, when I first went, I did not know that I would keep doing it. Mm -hmm. I thought, I'll try this. And um, I will say that if, uh, you know, I could be in this group to try to, um, to have it help me improve my poetry, but being with this group of women wants me to improve myself as a person. They're an amazing group of women. They're strong and, uh, and it's just really supportive. So that's my answer. You guys. <laughs> that sounds good. <laughs> <laughs> well, my reason for even bringing people together was uh, Lisa and I have been writing for 18 years. We, we, I think I invited a group of people way back 18 years ago. There was a snowstorm night, and Lisa was the only one that showed up at the door. <laughs> and from that point on, we stayed very dedicated. We still, still write. We still do once a month each, with each other and with the group as well. But I thought it was really important, because it was just the two of us, to broaden and learn more from others, have other voices come in, um, and... And it definitely has happened. Like, we all feed each other so much and grow from each other tremendously. So um, I just wanted to branch out. I thought Lisa and I were doing great, but we just, and, right? We spiced it up. <laughs> we spiced it up. And I agree with what Jesse had said previously, which is that we all maintain a really unique style and voice. Um, and I learned so much from that every time. So yeah, a beautiful group of humans and and that hook that kind of keeps us going of you know what we bring to the group with you know the different prompts and exercises we bring and what we learn from each other. In snacks. In snacks. <laughs> there are snacks. There are good snacks. Yeah, I, and I would also say that um, with anyone who's been in a, in a writing group or that kind of group, that we get really do get to know each other's voice, style, whatever it is we're working toward and can um, help mirror that back, you know, to the, to the writer and say, y you know, yes, or, or know that, that, that it could, you know, is there a different, you know, is that really what you want to say or something? Not, I mean, and that's not criticism, but it's more, it's always that refining and, and clarifying and holding it uh, for each person. And the more we know about each other's writing, the sort of more dedicated we get to that, yeah. to doing that. Yeah, to supporting each other. Mm -hmm.
One thing I can say is that I, I, of all the group, I'm the least, I have no formal training at all with poetry. Um, you know, everyone else here has really studied poetry deeply, and I really haven't. And um, so I always was, I, sometimes I feel, uh, you know, like a little bit of the imposter syndrome. But <laughs> the fact is, you know, I've, I've stayed with it. I, at first I was pretty intimidated, I would say. And, you know, I, but you know, now I feel like this is really my, my group, my, it's my tribe. Don't let her fool you. Yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. She's amazing. Yeah. We're intimidated by her sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, yes. Everyone has evolved tremendously. Yeah, for sure. Um, so, I know one other thing I wanted to say is that each one of us has something we go after in our critique form. It's really interesting. I watch that, or I listen for it. When poems are read, each... Close in 10 minutes. In five? 10 minutes. 10, okay, thank you. Um, it's really interesting the focus each one of us has when it comes to critiquing, and you'll hear it come in the way, uh, what we look for, which we have five different people looking at the elephant from different mm -hmm. angles. It's awesome. So we really get our poems tweaked nicely. Um, thank you everyone for being here. And there are books in the back um, if anyone's interested. Thank you. <laughs>